Ok. okay. You're live. Ok. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, for me, it's a pleasure presented uh, Shirin Faraji. Uh, she uh, received uh, her uh, degree master from Iran University. Her PhD obtained uh, from Heidelberg University. And from 2012, uh, has started her own group, uh, research group in the Groningen. Her research focused on the development and application of hybrid classical and quantum dynamical methods that she will show you. So at this moment, Shirin is the chair of the theoretical chemistry at CEMIC Institute for Advanced Materials in the University of Groningen in the Netherlands. So today she will talk about the database accelerated on the fly hybrid quantum classical dynamics. Uh, I think so she will present the process the quantum classical and dynamical methods to study the process and quantum effects in biomolecules and novel materials. Please, Shirin. Thank you very much, Noelia. Great. Uh, so, first of all, I would like to start by thanking the organizers for inviting me here to this beautiful city, Noelia Osvaldo. And also, I think there is a lot of effort put on organizing a conference um, in such a pandemic time with a lot of rules and regulation. And you did a fantastic job. So, thank you very much. Um, so as Noelia said, I'm chairing the theoretical chemistry group in the um, University of Groningen. That's a city in the north of Netherlands. And uh, it's called a Little Amsterdam. So it's a, uh, one of the oldest, second oldest university in Netherlands. And in 2014, they celebrated 40th, 400 years anniversary of the university. And it's ranked by the best uh, interna by international students ranked that as the best uh, place for students for three years in a row. So it's a, it's a very a student life and lively city. What I like about the uh, Dutch culture is this casual biking style. So if you come to Netherlands, it's flat. It's completely opposite than here. Uh, so you see this a strong lady carrying um, five kids in one bike. That's very casual to see in the morning when they take the kids to the childcare or the, um, school. And you see, for example, another lady carrying a box of beer and uh, taking a luggage going to the train station is very normal. So you see another one with the bike and luggage. And it's also a very common means of um, um, transport. You see the prime minister bikes every day to work, something that you don't see in other countries. And also you are, the other one, you see that the king with the families on the bike in a park. If you come to University of Groningen, also before Corona, this is the way you face the university. It's like thousand bikes. You don't even find a place to park your own bike. In all universities around the world, the Nobel Prize winners, they receive a parking facility assigned to them. Professor Ben Feringa uh, travels uh, like commutes by bike. So he said, I don't want a parking place for my car, but I would like to have the same parking space for my bike. So if you go to the Faculty of Science and Engineering, there is a parking in the golden plates written, parking is reserved for um, a Nobel Prize winner, which is Ben Feringa there. So let's switch the gear to the science again. So I'm going to talk about photochemistry, that is the interaction of molecule with light. And they are super important for many natural phenomena, such as human production of vitamin D, 20 hours biological clock, and also the process that allows you to see this presentation, that is the vision. It's also important for modern um, technologies, such as uh, photomedicine, that you use light to detect, control, or uh, some biological process, and it's also for pho photopharmacologies. For example, you can activate a drug in a certain or transport a drug in a certain location and reduce the severe side effect of certain medicine. So, 
What we do as a theoretician, so we would like to know how, mo how the molecules behave when they are exposed to light. So I really like this metaphor that is all about the dance of atoms and molecules happening in a tiny fraction of a second, the moment that you shine light on them. So we theoreticians, we use um, computer, physics, chemistry, math, all these tools to manipulate this dance and this movement and design new molecules with optimized properties. So we would like to design a molecule when we shine a light, doesn't dance as they like, we want the dance that we want. So that's what I always teach to my students. In all these processes of photo-induced processes that is initiated by light, there is a molecule that I show in a simple case, sitting in a ground state, like an equilibrium state. You, you shine a light, it goes to a state of a higher energy that we call it excited state. And depending on excited state character or dynamics, different type of response can be generated. For example, you can fluoresce, you give the same light back approximately with some relaxation, and you come back to the ground state, and this is, for example, is called fluorescence that is used for fluorescence proteins as biomarkers. For example, I've seen many of you saw some picture of a tumor, something that is done by in photoimaging. You can also radiationless relax, have radiationless relaxation to the ground state, and that exactly makes our DNA stable. That's why we can go to the sun and enjoy sitting in the sun and having a glass of a beer because we are photostable species. Things can also happen in excited state, such as excited state electron transfer. So you do not necessarily come back to the ground state, but for example, electron transfer is responsible for DNA repair because when we go, there are like a lot of DNA lesion is forming in our body, but there is an enzyme that repairs that part. And this is also an enzyme that is initiated by light. I will briefly talk about that today too. For example, excited state energy transfer is used for opto optoelectronics. And chemistry can also happen in the excited state, as I explained. There is a protein in our eyes that goes through a photoisomerization, and this leads to what we call a visual response. And also in a very fancy application is this excited state proton transfer is responsible for the green glow of this jellyfish deep in the ocean. So this is also another photo-induced process like that happens in a very dark in the ocean. When you would like to study this system as a theoretician, so these are molecules. Molecules are composed of electrons and nuclei. So these are the involved particles. In a one simple picture, you can say, okay, I do not consider the electrons. I consider every atoms and I treat them classically. That brings you to the field that we call classical dynamics. This would be your simulation box. You use Newtonian equation of motion to observe your system evolving as a function of time. The interaction between all these balls or like uh, is uh, explained by somebody, we call it classical force field. You define what is bond, what is angle, what is dihedral, what is the non-bonded interactions. So that would be the description of your system. However, these are not typically applicable for excited state. Why? Because for a ground state, it's a fantastic approach. But for excited state, you need to know, first of all, there are always coupling between the excited state and the transition between them. So there is a strong coupling between the electronic degree of freedom that we ignored and the nuclear degree of freedom. They happen in multiple surfaces. And all those potential that you define for the ground state, you need to define for every excited state that you study. So in principle, it's not very simple. I'm going to show you an example why it's important to, to study this system quantum dynamically or quantum mechanically and not classically. So imagine that you have a system, a hypothetical system. Of course, I'm going to show you some example of them. That there is an electron donor that donates an electron to an electron acceptor. It can be in any system. It can be in the um, industrial application. It can be a biological system. And in the same system, you have a proton donor that donates a proton to a proton acceptor, okay? So before I continue, we call this proton couple electron transfer. So let me explain a little bit. 
Why is it important to study? It happens in many biological systems, such as photosynthesis, respiration. You see this water oxidation here. Immediately, you observe the relation between them. It's important for enzymatic reactions, such as light-induced DNA repair. It's also important for clean energy devices. I think you're all familiar with this from your electrochemistry courses, if you're a chemist that is used for fuel cells, solar cells, and energy devices. So this process is in many places. So what we do want to know about this system is how this uh, process happens. So you have, we would like to know whether, for example, electron goes first, proton follows, proton goes first, electron follows. They go in a concerted fashion, or you have a charge combination and a hydrogen transfer. So you would like to develop a theory that can distinguish between all these type of process that I discussed because they already, if you would like to optimize a process, the efficiency, the quantum yield of a process, you need to know how this happens. So you need a theory that is capable of capturing and distinguishing between these four scenarios that I just explained. If I consider one electron transfer and one proton transfer, I find myself in four states. At the first state, both electrons and protons are in a, in a donor. In a final state, is in an acceptor. And the other two states, in the octagonal part, belongs to where either electron or proton is transferred. The sequential is when you walk along the edges of this rectangle. And the concerted one is along the diagonal. And I would like to give us you like a, a hint, which I'm going to come back to it, is that this concerted pathway avoids those high energy charge intermediate states. And in nature, it's very important. For example, we don't want to have these high uh, energy radicals in our body. And that's the whole idea of having an antioxidant in medicine in, or in many fruits as well. If I have one electron transfer, the scenario is very simple. So I, have, I can use um, Marcus electron transfer theory. So I have this Marcus parabola electronic states. It's similar to the transition state theory for chemistry. Electrons are faster than a nuclei. Tunneling is ignored. So, But I, what I would like to bring your attention is to the solvent coordinate. Is the reorganization of the environment that leads to this electron to hop from one side to the other side. It's a thermally induced reorganization of the environment or a solvent or whatever you have that prepares the situation for the electron transfer. But if I have one proton transfer alone, there are also theories developed based on a Marcus theory for proton transfer, where semi-classical approach is used to study the, to include the ton proton uh, tunneling. And also you can use electronic structure calculations to calculate the non body coupling, whether electron is faster or slower than a proton and distinguish that. The complication comes when there is a proton coupled electron transfer because this Parabolas no longer refers to electronic states, but the vibronic state that, in the, that you need to describe. And also, may, may I refer you to the review by Sharon Hamas Schiffer that it's a substantial study and developed tools to study these systems that we also use. What I would like to also mention here is this combined solvent coordinate. First of all, why I always say proton coupled electron transfer? Because the answer is very simple. Depending on where electron seats will affect the potential of a proton, and depending on where proton seats will affect the potential of electron. So there is always coupling between them. So we are talking about whether this is an, a strong coupling or a weak coupling. So the coupling is there. Another scenario is that you might ask, okay, electron is a much lighter particle, so it travels much faster than a proton, so these two are very separated. But there are many instances that there is no distinction between a time scale of electron transfer and proton transfer. And indeed, they are strongly coupled. And you can experimentally, you cannot distinguish between these two different time scales. Why? Because the environment, we are no longer in a gas phase that the mass is the only criteria to define. The environment might create a thermally induced situation that favors more the proton transfer rather than electron transfer, despite of the fact that it's a heavier um, particle. And when we talk about electron transfer, we are talking about them traveling through the space, 
But for proton, typically chemists know this happens within a hydrogen bond distance. So even the proton needs to travel much shorter distance compared to the electron. So there are a lot of theoretical challenges. One is the time scale that we need to study from electrons from femtosecond to the solvent and protein environment that goes to the time scale of a picosecond. If you go to the protein configuration, even it's a microsecond. These are inherently quantum particles. So I need to include hydrogen proton tunneling. I need to have excited electronic vibrational states. I need to have the degree of freedom or the coupling between these two degree of freedom. And last but not least, chemistry happens in a complex environment including the, the protein environment, solvent, or solid state, is adds a huge degree of complication. So in, to give you a pictorial picture for, to study this system quantum dynamically, it's very challenging. First is a reaction coordinate is uh, causing a lot of problems. So consider water has three degree of freedom. You go to a benzene, it's already 30. It gets, it's, remember this three and minus six degree of freedom, it gets, immediately very large. The other one is the need for potential energy surfaces that you need to run the dynamic on, pre-computed, as well as describing the coupling between these surfaces is another one, plus the size of the environment that all these quantities needs to be computed. So let me talk about the theoretical approach that is electrons and nuclei. Nuclei can behave as a quantum particle that brings us to the field that is called time, uh, it, um, to solve the time-dependent uh, Schrodinger equation in the field of quantum dynamics for nuclei. And um, we rely, we use multi-configuration time-dependent Hartree, and in particular, multi-layer variant of that that will allow us to treat my larger degree of freedoms. And the dynamics typically is run on explicit and uh, implicit potential energy surfaces. And I am a fan of uh, on the fly dynamics. We use a Gaussian version of the um, MCTDH, which I'm going to explain these um, uh, abbreviations here, uh, which allows me to perform quantum dynamics on the fly. And the outcome of this simulation is dynamical observable, such as high resolution time resolved spectroscopy, electronic population, or quantum flux or quantum yield. To perform quantum dynamics, you need electronic structure. That brings us to the field we call it quantum chemistry, where we solve time independent Schrodinger equation for electrons. There are methods for ground and excited states, and for the, to include the role of the environment, there are many explicit and implicit approaches. We use hybrid quantum classical um, um, framework, which is called QMMM. In addition, we are actively developing quantum um, mechanically driven force field and by using QM effective fragment potentials. Of course, as I talk about these challenges, it's a multi-scaling approach. I like this quote, I would like to quote uh, Benedetta Manucci always says that it's a multi-scaling approach, so you need a multi-scaling solution. So we divide the system to a quantum part and a classical part. What we use, the quantum mechanical part is treated quantum dynamically with the full quantum dynamic of the electrons and nuclei rather than the pure electronic structure calculation, the static one relying on the Born-Oppenheimer approximation. And I would like to emphasize when we need a more need for more precision, you can always come up with a system bass formalism within your QM region. And I would like to say this div division of a classical part and a quantum part for a system bath formalism not only makes the calculation computationally feasible, but also makes a clear distinction between the essential and non-essential part of your problem. And this is in line with what we call for multi-scaling approaches as accurate as necessary and as large as needed. So for non-adiabatic dynamics, I like this 2D plot where you have this quantum description versus the nature of being on the fly, the cheapest. For, on the fly goes to our value, your calculation is cheap. So I'm going to explain what is MCTDH, where in this framework, which we call it the standard approach or exact method, your wave packet is represented as a linear combination of a hearty product of time independent basis function represented on a grid, and the time dependency is in your coefficient. Then you use a variational principle, you get a set of equation of motion for your expansion coefficients. In another extreme end, there is a method we call time dependent Hartree, 
where you express, you introduce uh, time dependent basis functions, as you see here, I um, marked it as a red. And then the calculations or the computational cost is significantly reduced. It's a very cheap approach, but what is missing, there is no linear combination, there is no sum means the correlation between all degree of freedom is ignored. So you are going to have a cheap calculation where all degree of freedoms are independent, which is not very real for chemistry. What we use is an MCTDH that combines the efficiency of a mean field approach, such as time-dependent heart rate, with the numerical accuracy of the exact method. You see, it's similar to the exact one. The difference is that now I'm using a time-dependent basis function and I'm using the sum, but I'm not including all the sum. So it's like a selected configuration. So I'm reducing my configuration space. So what is nice is an variational approach. You can always increase the number of uh, configuration you include to go to an exact method to check the convergence, or but depending on the property that you're looking, you can always be in between or closer to the time-dependent heart rate. And you see that with the same number, for example, for a standard method for F F eight degree of freedom, 32 primitive basis function, you need 48 terabyte, while with MCTDH, you are fine with one around one gigabyte to perform the same calculation with the same level of accuracy. Of course, your MCTDH particles don't need to be one dimensional. You can combine those also to a multi-dimensional particles. And um, this has been done in many, many fields. Uh, and of course, the single particle are represented as a linear combination of the Hearty product of the time in, uh, independent basis function represented on a grid. So to give you a pictorial picture, if you have a system of uh, S that composed of six degree of freedom, that would be your system. If you use MCTDH, you are introducing MCTDH or logical coordinates that you see the capital N and the, the small N is a difference here, is a computation you get. You can combine the modes. So now instead of you have three modes or three MCTDH modes that represent your six modes. So in principle, you reduce this dimension very well. And you can go to a multi-layer. Now you have a very well approach to describe your system. You're going to use the same approach to describe your single particle function. So you can introduce different levels. And this N1, N2, and N3, they don't need to be necessarily equal, okay? That's a pictorial way of the equation I was showing. To give you an, um, the, what is the gain, for example, for a pyrazine, which is 24 degree of freedom, when you run an MCTDH, it will take you around 89 hours, and with the multi-layer, it's just 15 minutes that you are done. So I also like to call it coarse grain quantum dynamics. What I like the most is a, an on-the-fly version of MCTDH, a Gaussian version of MCTDH that is similar to, sorry, this is an MCTDH equation to you to keep in mind. The Gaussian version is that I'm going to, it was introduced first uh, to for a system bath formalism, means that the degree of freedom that is important, I treat them on the grid, blue, you see, similar to MCTDH. But the, the, the degree of freedom that are not important, I use time-dependent Gaussian basis function. So that's, that's all fine, but now I can use time-dependent basis function, Gaussian basis function for all my degree of freedom. I call it the fat traveling Gaussian. And that brings me to the field that is called variational multi-configuration Gaussian that I use time-dependent Gaussian basis function for all my degree of freedom. The gain here is that the localized nature of the Gaussian basis function allows me to perform quantum dynamics on the fly because each configuration represents a point in a configuration space that the electronic structure can be performed. This is in the nature of trajectory-based approaches. And of course, this is another way which I was talking. You can always switch between them. If you have a degree of freedom that is super important, you can always read them and agree the rest on a degree of freedom. But I like the on the fly nature or the free lunch that variational multi-configuration Gaussian offers. Now we can come to another approximate approach that is surface hopping, it's a semi-classical approach. So what is the scenario here? You're in a ground state and then you go to the first excited state, the nuclear wave packet 
So in principle, you're always doing an ensemble of trajectories. You need to, to mimic the quantum effects. The nu nuclei follow the uh, Newtonian equation. That's why we call it semi-classical, because electrons are treated um, uh, using a time-dependent Schrodinger equations for a um, nuclei. So this is basically the scenario. So what we do in our group, we bring all these fields that I explained to you together for that I need a software that performs quantum dynamics, that is quantics, developed in UK by uh, Graham Wars and his team. And it's, uh, I need an electronic structure uh, software. We use QCAM for many reasons. And also I need to, for, to include the role of the environment, we need some more classical dynamic software, which is Gromax that we use. So bringing these three fields to an interface will allow you to perform quantum dynamics for a larger system with explicit inclusion of the environment. We recently, like 2020, released the first um, software that's the interface between them. And then you can, uh, you want to run the dynamics depend on which propagator you want to use. You can have lambda zeno, you can have velocity valley, you can have different optimizer, you can have surface hopping. Tolly that we also implemented. And then what, it, what we like about here is what we call a database is this single, we call it SPP, which is surface point provider. If I want to have an accurate surfaces, I can build up using electronic structure software. We have an interface with QCAM, TurboMol, PySCF. And you can also use interpolators like neural network interpolators, Shepard interpolators, RBF interpolators to have a, to reduce, you can have fitted potential energy surfaces. You can also have model potential energy surfaces. So there are a lot of models we implement, harmonic oscillator, pyrazine, Schneider, depends on the author who developed this model. So you can always add to the plugging engine, which you, later on people can use that. To give you an idea, is a simple case. It's a SO2, which is a um, three degree of freedom. Here you have, so you have this bending mode. And then you have this asymmetric mode. So when the system goes from the ground state to the excited state, there is a very close by conical intersection to the ground to the um, uh, to the lower state. And here I'm showing you uh, between S1 and S2. You, you see here. So what you don't see here is that the deviation between the ab initio based surfaces, the energies, and the fitted one are this dashed line and uh, the solid line. For the solid line, you need, so we reduce around uh, like 15,000 uh, number of electronic structure you save when you go to the interpolated surfaces and the dynamic capture basically the same. So you need a population transfer from the excited state for S2 to S1 and you see the both show the same thing. Even the small population transfer to the ground state that is the black curve here is also captured properly. And this you can run it in your laptops for these fitted potential energy surfaces. I was very inspired, so I hired someone from a computer science department, uh, Albert, who is um, uh, has studied artificial intelligence. He is implementing various neural networks, so he gets our database. He separates them between uh, into the training and validation sets. Select a model; it can be different interpolation interpolators with optimized parameters, and then. Test the networks within a range to see. So it's a work in the progress. So we, we are working on the manuscript to, to show what would be the game here. We also have an interface between QCAM and Gromax, uh, which uh, the interface is not only communicating between these two software, but also performs the, the, the dynamics. For example, we have one of our MD implemented. We have Tolly's uh, FSS. H method implemented, and um, so it's a standalone um, propagator as well, but while um, still communicating between Gromax and QCAM for electronic structure part and a classical part. It's a work with the US. To just give you a preliminary result that we have, typically, for example, if I here I'm showing you chromophore in a box that we study. Absorption property of that, you see that in principle, you have experimental method, which is 3.4. It's a very small system here. Typically, people run MD, taking a snapshots and take an average of the calculation. And then you see that you are around, we checking all the DFT functionals, you are around 3 EV. But when you use GIFs with a better sampling, even within a 20 picosecond, you are very close to the experimental value. So, 
How much time do I have? Okay. So um, in addition to um, uh, some, which is uh, in complementary to my talk today, in addition to um, software development, we are also excited by very various applications such as photo switchable molecular motors that are relevant for molecular electronics, uh, far red fluorescence proteins relevant for optogenetics, photo switchable DNA G quadruplex for nanomedicine, and singlet fusion in molecular uh, solids relevant for solar cells. So being in Groningen is basically, there is no way that you can not get involved in the exciting work of uh, Ben, uh, developing a photo switchable molecular motors. By the more slow coming to its end, there is a new urgency for a new paradigm of um, data storage and information. And this is uh, the whole idea of a single molecular um, um, electronics, where the single molecule is connected to two electrodes and is used to, um, and the mechanism of the conducting is a quantum mechanical tunneling. So the idea is that there, you know, the hypothesis is that if you have a molecule that can stay in various states, remember the whole um, how the um, computer works, it can switch between zero and one. So in principle, you can encode information. So it has been always speculated that you can use these photo-induced molecular motors as that in different states, if they, are, they have a stable or metastable state, to use for molecular electronic devices. So you have this molecular motor, it's overcrowded alkans developed in Heidelberg, uh, in a Groningen, sorry, that uh, it goes through four step uh, photo uh, switching process. The first step is uh, photoisomerization, and then like your protein in your eyes, and then you go through a thermal helix uh, inversion, and then again, suddenly you uh, shine a light. Second, photoisomerization, thermal helix inversion. Why is a motor? Because it has a, it's a control motion, it uh, consumes energy, it has a direction, and it's a repetitive process. So you can spin it as long as you hit it with light. So the directionality is very important. So we studied all these four steps, defining the dihedral that grants uh, this motion. We define the ground state potential energy surfaces with the barriers on the ground state using a spin flip DFT. We have studied the excited state process, excited state minimum, the minimum energy crossing, which are resembling your conical intersection. We discovered how these four steps happens, but in fact, it's a beautiful motion. So it's a type of um, tidal locked motion that these two pi, like rotator and a stator, this pi pi interaction is kept through space during the entire photo switching. So this type of interaction make sure that this through a space quantum tunneling is on the entire switching process. And it's similar to um, the, the rotation of a moon. We, just, we always see one side of that. So it's really facing to keep this interaction. So um, yeah, that was one. We also use um, a, single, um, um, the, a study singlet fusion in molecular solids which are like potential mechanisms to increase the efficiency of the solar cells because with one photon, you can incre increase char four charge carriers. But the mechanism where you go from this singlet to the double triplet is, uh, as you said, always a debate. Whether it's a charge transfer mediated super exchange, is a charge hopping, is a direct mechanism. We did, did a study in um, tetras and in the crystals. We use excited state descriptors to identify different type of excited state, local excited state, charge resonance, charge transfer, and um, exit on resonance. And we observed that there are low-lying charge transfer uh, states which, uh, with, um, for uh, diamers with a um, non-zero electronic coupling, while there is a charge resonance state with um, dimers with um, zero electronic coupling. And this was in uh, this year was in a cover of the PCCP as well. We also use the DNA uh, photo switches to control the DNA for nanotechnology. So these are the plates of the G quadrant that you op you put this azobenzene, you shine a light, you can open and close this plate. And um, so we observed this. Uh, it's very interesting that only a certain type of derivative of azobenzene goes to this long um, um, term motion, and uh, while in this um, the fast part of the process nothing happens, there is no difference between them, but in a longer um, time scale, there is a difference. 
And also we do the exactly the same process in red fluorescence proteins, which was a revolution in biology, it allowed us to see processes that they were invisible in the past, like uh, you see labeling tracking cancer cells, tumor growth. Reds are particularly interesting because how our body works, because we want to observe something that does not observe in the, absorb in the same range that our body material observe. We did the excited state relaxation time scale for the um, M plum. We were able to perform um, ab initio MD and excited state MD and uh, capture two different time scale for this process. At the moment, we are working in the um, phyto phytochrome photoreceptor. Uh, that is near IR, fluorescence proteins. We are studying a different uh, excited state uh, processes, which is the uh, proton transfer and photoisomerization. At the moment, we did the study for um, monomeric and dimeric form with the role of the environment. When you have an environment, when you don't have it, what are the changes? And also, as I said, we um, uh, one of the fascinating enzyme that works in nature and is initiated by light is the uh, DNA photolysis. So it's an um, enzyme that comes and binds to your DNA to re repair this DNA lesion. So um, the first um, uh, cofactor in this enzyme absorbs the light. It's a photoantenna. Then the excitation energy is transferred to the second cofactor that transfers an electron to the lesion and also the, the experimentalists detect the proton transfer. We have studied this mechanism and we discovered that the operating mechanism is the proton coupled electron transfer. And we were able to identify the first, for the first time, the structure that uh, the experimentalist measured as an intermediate for this repair, which was published in 2016. And um, our big goal is to be able to complete this method development with the goal of a hybrid and hierarchical methodology to tackle large systems. With a quantum dynamics in a complex environment, with a fully quantum treatment of a nuclei in the molecules of moderate size, moderate size, I mean 50 heavy atoms, to be able to perform high level electronic structure methods with the explicit inclusion of the environment, which will be unfortunately still in a classical level. And this is my team that I just try to represent today in the ground state. And this is in their excited state. And I would like to also thank by the funding agencies. And if I inspired any of you or any of your students, uh, I would really encourage you to send them to apply for the Erasmus Master Theoretical Chemistry and Computational Modeling. It's a fantastic training. All my PhD students, mainly coming from this TCCM program, very well equipped with the computational knowledge to start a PhD. So if please bring and send a message to any of uh, your colleagues or uh, students that you know of. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. And I'm very happy if there is any point that we can continue discussing. Thank you for this very nice, interesting talk. And uh, now it's uh, opening for the discussion. So some question. Andrea, please. Okay, <laughs> very nice talk, <laughs> Shirin. And uh, just a few questions. One, uh, it is uh, more uh, from a computational point of view. So you described the merging of different uh, approaches. So we have electronic structure, uh, we have uh, uh, near in accurate quantum mechanics, uh, then we have all this kind of stuff and many other kind of stuff merged together. How difficult it is for a, a guy that for the first time start using this approach to enter into it? It is really easy for the user, so one has to know a little bit more in detail what <laughs> you did inside. Thank you very much. 
as I said, we are really developing different um, softwares to a single tool with a user-friendly interface. For example, Pipeserve can be used by our master's students developing a plugin for that. So if you know how to run electronic structure calculations, you know the keywords, of course, every software has different keywords. But my concern is about the quantum dynamics part that cannot be used as you use electronic structure because the convergence criteria is not certain on the energy that you can commit. There are certain things, because I was explaining this MCTDH, the number of primitive basis function you use, um, you can, it's really variational. So you can use a very cheap approach and still is fine for the absorption spectra, but for another property is very limited. But for a QMMM and Gromax, that's much easier to use because the Gromax people develop so many analysis tools. That's why I use an, um, a Gromax as a main driver for GIPS because we don't want to invent a new molecular dynamics when there is such a development. So why should I waste my time and reinvent the engine? And these are beautifully analysis tools. So you really can have figures ready for publication out of the analysis tool. It's like really no extra work is needed. So the main concern here, which we also pay extra attention, is the, the PISERF, the, 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 the interaction with the quantum dynamics software. There you need to be a little bit careful. But I don't think that you will have any difficulties to enter or the learning curve for people who have hands in computation is very low. Okay, second question. Yeah. Second. Just to say. So this methodology is not developed necessarily for proton copper electron transfer. That was an example I always use to say people, why do we need quantum? Why is something is missing? But we actually use it for photochemical processes. For astrochemistry, it's much more easier to use because it's a gas phase. The environment is not very important. The molecules are small. And the most of the people who work in quantum dynamics actually work with experimentalists who work in astrochemistry because of the size of the system who are small. It's always collision, the reaction flux, and so on. In that aspect, it's much more convenient to use it. For example, currently, um, for that, you can use quantum dynamics, like um, a variation of multi-configuration Gaussian. But if your system is bigger, I really advise to use um, surface hopping because it's sufficient. You have, if you don't have an environment, that would be also perfectly fine. Thank you. There is some more questions. Very, very easy. Easy. Uh, easy, and easy. Easy. Sure, sure. easy and fast. Sure, sure. Easy and fast. It can be difficult, but it should be short. It's okay. No, no, no. It's, uh, you can come here, but we need to hear. Otherwise, the people, people online cannot hear you. Okay. Okay. So, though, basically, is quite. Uh, well, see, the question is simple. The the answer I don't know basically because it depends on you. But uh, the application and what with in projected in the future. For example, what do you think about the, the, the application of this technique and how this technique maybe can be applied in, uh, in the normal daily life, uh, the sample for the industry, for example, or something like that? Uh, for industry, it has a great application. At least I'm personally interested would be in photomedicine and photopharmacology. So you can actually have uh, near IR molecular motors, which is also synthesized, um, I think, last year that you can send it to the cells, how they are going to drill into the cells. So everything that you can use a light to, to destroy tumors, to activate drugs. So these are the things that you can predict that will have an application, of course, for molecular electronics, but I'm really interested in photomedicine. So that would be my prediction. Okay, thank you. There is not more time for the questions. 
Sorry, there is not more time for the question. Thank you. Thank you, Sherry. Shirin. It's a very pleasure that you are here. Also, I would like to remind like, uh, her for the TCCM students. Uh, try to do that they doing the application. Okay, uh, we have a finish. Okay, thank you, Shirin, again for uh, the nice talk. Um, so uh, now we have uh, we continue with the parallel session. Uh, there is no official closing ceremony in the program, so probably um, we simply say thank you to all people that made it possible to uh, organize the event here in uh, such beautiful city and such comfortable environment. We thank the local organizer Chiara, Ivan all the staff, all the young volunteers, they made a tremendous effort. You can imagine because considering rules and uh, constraints, we have what was a tremendous effort. OK, I, I guess tomorrow is not useful to have the closing ceremony at the end of the parallel session because no one will hear us. So it's just the last occasion. Thank you so much. I have to mention one thing. Uh, besides then giving instruction to the people in this uh, lecture room about our whereabouts for the social leader and so on, that we are of course having the best paper award uh, is Vando. So we are going to announce the winners, those who have been evaluated up until today because we have session tomorrow as well. So we will put online, of course, the names of all the winners and those who have presented online and uh, the winners will then be contacted for the awards. And if there are winners at the social dinner, of course, they will get a round of applause also for all the others who were online because it is a kind of a collective <laughs> winning. <laughs> and we are glad that they were able to come with us. Yeah, the, the, the last, the last uh, consideration, please follow the website, ICCSA.org, where you can find any update also for uh, 2022 event, okay? So yes. everything will be posted there because we used uh, since this year not having printed stuff. So the website, of course, is the main reference yes. uh, source of information. Okay. Well, we will be announcing the, the next year's conference. Yeah. So, yeah, sure. So uh, thank you, everybody. The sessions are going to follow uh, to, to our audience online. Also, uh, see you soon, hopefully, next year. And thank you for all your attention. Bye bye. Here, we meet at uh, tonight? Yes. Okay. Yeah. But, uh,